Welcome back everyone to Vox Markets. My name is Paul Hill. On today's Voice of Wall Street, I am delighted to be able to speak to Michael Farr of Farr, Miller and Washington, one of the US's finest investment uh, firms. So welcome, Michael. Thank you very much, Paul. It's nice to be with you. Yeah, well, um, now given the concerns over Omicron, also with uh, rising inflation expectations and uh, Jerome Powell's recent pivot with, to, towards tightening, what's your sort of view for equities in 2022? I think equities have a challenge in front of them in 2022, but I think the path of least resistance continues to be higher. So a number of things are going on that I think are rather important. Number one, the market's reaction to Omicron. And that is that markets are figuring out how to process new variants of COVID. Two years ago, we had no idea what to do with the pandemic. Six months later, we were dealing with a pandemic. This time last year, we were just hearing about vaccines and that they were available. So this has been moving very, very quickly. If you use, and, and it's an unfortunate example, but if you use terrorism as an example and think, remember back to 9-11 and the various events, 9-11 was crippling for markets, some news, very unexpected. And then in subsequent events of terrorism, markets knew how to price that information. They don't make social comments. Markets have no empathy. Markets have very little soul, I'm afraid, but, but uh, they, even, even on the Paris bombings, uh, when that happened a couple of years ago, markets actually closed higher. Uh, they, markets are just recognizing that these incidents of violence uh, that are isolated around the world don't have broad economic impact that we have a new variant, and if the variant behaves within certain boundaries, markets know how to react. So markets, I believe, have reacted to this particular COVID variant better than they have previous. And as the news is evolving to show that, uh, yes, it appears a good deal more contagious at this point, it seems as if the symptoms are less severe. If that continues, then I think markets are going to continue on their course. So there's number one. Number two, prior to COVID, the economic problem in the US was not a supply problem. It was a demand problem. And despite trillions of dollars of fiscal and monetary stimulus in the US, going back to the great financial crisis of 08 and 09, we've seen in just trillions of dollars created and printed and shoved into this economy, mm. there was no greater demand. Demand, we weren't creating demand in the US. We were seeing a much wider and increasing wealth disparity, income disparity, which is a big problem economically. Uh, uh, social concerns aside, the US economy is based two thirds on the US consumer. Mm. The majority of those consumers didn't see an increase in income, and they did not see really much of an increase in assets because only about half, eh, 60% of Americans actually own real estate and own stocks. So if, you're, if you didn't have those things, your wealth didn't increase, and you weren't seeing gains in income. So the consumers didn't have more to spend. So for all of the monetary stimulus, we didn't see an increase in demand. With this pandemic, we saw huge fiscal stimulus where checks were sent to Americans, big, significant checks on a regular basis. The savings rate in this country went up. Individuals started to save a lot of money, have a lot of cash. As an example, when you look at the third quarter, uh, end of the second quarter, beginning of the third quarter report from J.P. Morgan, they showed that credit card activity was up 34% in the quarter and that credit card balances increased only 2%. So for all of that additional credit that was being used, they weren't borrowing money. It wasn't mm -hmm. being actually uh, borrowed uh, and created on credit. So we had a very strong consumer. The consumer was assisted by the government and then because of the supply chain issues, we've got this resulting inflation. Many economists in the US 
think that the Federal Reserve is actually behind the curve. They were critical of this notion of transitory, uh, and it doesn't seem to be transitory. CPI. I think, I think Jerome morning. Powell also thinks it's, uh, he's, he should have been critical of transitory because he's taken it away now, hasn't he, of his definition? Well, I had a, a friend from the Wall Street Journal who said we went from a Fed that was data dependent to now data independent, mm -hmm. uh, which, which I thought was rather clever. Um, and, and, and yes, the Fed now says there is a lot of money, recognizes a lot of money in the system, and they've changed their position. And of course, they've changed their position to say they're going to slow the rate of accommodation. They're still buying, of course. What, do you, still expect, what do you expect next week, Michael, from the FMOC um, decision on Wednesday? The language of that decision, Paul, is going to be very important. And how Powell gets through his presser, uh, if, he, if he actually has a press conference afterwards, uh, I think he will. Um, it, 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 we're going to be listening for a lot of nuance there. And here is, is what we're talking about. The, the surveys in the U.S. of most economists expect for two rate hikes next year and three in 2023. Um, the first of those is uh, the odds are the percentages are expected for as early as May and then a uh, high, much higher consensus for a rate in, hike in June. The language around the taper was that it was to end in June. Powell and other Fed presidents have suggested that could happen faster. So if they end in, we're, we're looking to hear if they're going to end them fast. Mm -hmm. If they're going to end those in March, uh, when would they begin hiking? So these are things that we're going to listen for next week. There's been another big change, Paul. And the other big change has been on the, on the last bit of news from the Fed that they were going to accelerate this taper and really begin to move forward. Interest rates went down and interest rates went below 1.5% and briefly mm. below 1.4% on the 10 year treasury. Yeah. Now that's big, but the really big thing that struck me was that the tech stocks fell on that news. Every other time we have seen interest rates fall, we've seen mm. tech stocks surge, particularly the FANG stocks. And that why was that? Happen. Why is that? Well, uh, one of the reasons that they surge is because a lot of the earnings uh, for those stocks are, mm. are, are still out in the future. And so we use a discounted present value of earnings and cash flow streams for those companies to determine value. When you lower that interest rate number in your calculation, it's a formula that you use, yeah. it makes those future numbers look a lot higher uh, and vice versa. So, um, but it was surprising. It was surprising that you, you, as you would rightly point out, that they actually, the, stex, the tech stocks fell out of bed, the real sort of like Icarus type ones, which are sort of like falling down to earth. Your DocuSigns, your Pelotons and... Uh, People like I that. love talking. You know, when I when I I went to the um, University of the South in Sewanee, Tennessee, for my undergraduate degree in English literature, and then I taught uh, fifth and sixth form uh, English uh, when I when I was out of school. Um, I love talking to Brits because you will use Icarus in an example, and there isn't. A, I mean, you're not going to find ten Americans anywhere who are going to do that. So God bless you. This is wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> I, le I learned it from my Latin lessons when I was at school. Yeah, they don't do that anymore. But anyway, so, so, why, so why did the super expensive tech stocks, the sort of the, the classic um, Kathy Wood ARK innovation funds, why have they fallen out of bed when the 10-year treasury actually has, has, has come back off from a sort of 1.6, 1.7 down to about 1.5? Really surprising. You know, it's a good observation, but surprising. Well, it was surprising. And I think that the markets are listening to the Fed. I think that the markets, I think we saw two things. I think we saw the Fed finally blink. The Fed blinked and said, We're, we've got to stop this and we've got to raise rates. And I, that was the first blink. The second blink was that markets believed them. And if a market is a forward pricing mechanism, then we're thinking that these low rates are not here forever, uh, that rates could go higher. Uh, there are supposed to be five rates total of uh, one and a quarter percent on the short end, which would take you right up against the 10-year treasury. Uh, and 
we, we typically don't see the Fed increase short rates such that it will invert the yield curve. So you've got to have some sort of spread between that 125 and the 10 year. Uh, 10 year has to go to 2% or higher over the next two years. And that changes the math for investors. I wouldn't give up on the tech stocks, but I believe that that change is here to stay. That shift to value stocks that have been woeful underperformers going back to 2008 and 9, I think that that shift back to those stocks that are a little bit oh, less exciting, the Pepsi Colas and Procter and Gambles and Mondelez sort of stocks. Mondelez makes Oreo cookies. I don't yes. know how you. You've got to invest in Oreo it's cookies. Capri's as you? well from the UK. Yes. I mean, you need those Capri's, don't you? I mean, you do. Who, they lo they I love mean, it. But I think you raise an absolutely brilliant point, really important for investors, because if the Fed starts tightening, it appears as though investors now, the valuation equation is becoming important as part of the investment thesis. So ones where you've had these, as you say, these Star Trek type valuations on super expensive tech stocks. Now valuation is becoming important and it seems to be coming out of those ones where it's going into stocks with valuation where it is a support, isn't it, I guess? And I think that, that you could see a number of years where those value stocks will indeed outperform. Um, Though I'm uh, now a bit concerned, we've gone from Icarus to Star Trek. It's feeling much more American. Yeah, sorry about that. We'll be, <laughs> in, the, we'll be in the Jetsons by the end of this. <laughs> so just on valuation, I mean, you, when you look at sort of like big picture, and I know, I mean, I, you know, I tip my hat to you guys because you're very much like sort of Warren Buffett, but he, he, he looks at sort of like the market capitalization of the S&P 500 to GDP, and it's about two. And just to put that in comparison, it's about one in the UK. Now, you, what, we have a different type of blend of, of stock, of yes. stocks to obviously the, the S&P 500, but it just shows you that actually two times GDP for the stock for the S&P 500, is that getting to a little richer at 20 times PE or uh, is it, you just got to, it's becoming a far more of a stock selection market? I think there are a number of historical measures that will show you that stock prices are very full um, one of the things um, that we have noticed at other periods when uh, interest rates are very low is that price to earnings ratios run a bit higher. So 19 or 20 times earnings in a mm, one to 2% inflation environment is normal, but that's not what we have. And in fact, CPI data this morning in the US showed that inflation is running a good deal hotter uh, and is expected to run fairly hot into 2022. So we would expect those price to earnings ratios to come lower on average. I remember, and I'm not sure what to make of this, but I, I find successful investors have to embrace the unknown. You have to realize that basically at the end of the day, you don't know what in God's name markets are gonna do over the next 12 or 24 months. And now you still have the responsibility to invest responsibly. But in the 1970s, we had the Nifty 50. And there were these 50 big industrial stocks that were trading at almost 50 times earnings. And the small and mid cap stocks were all around 10 times earning. And the common wisdom of the day was you had to buy the small and mid cap stocks because those two valuations were certainly going to come back together at some point. They did indeed. The Nifty 50 came down to 10 times earnings. That wasn't the expectation. I mean, you were better off if you did buy those small and mid. So I think you're always well advised to buy a stronger balance sheet, stronger value. Uh, it's um, it's it can, a market can go from uh, how much money you're making and how hot a hand you have, a la Kathy Woods, to uh, how much money you've saved, how much you've protected, and how much you can still keep at the end of the day. Never forget that anything that can go up very quickly can come down very quickly. And yeah, nobody that, likes them on their fall. Year. We found didn't that out we? last year during March and, and April when it absolutely uh, tanked. So, so, so just going forward then, you're looking at sort of like with, with companies with good balance sheets and brands. Is, is it sort of you, what, what, what the ideal sort of like uh, 
farm miller and Washington type stock? Is it pricing power or, 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 or good value or what? Or what, what sort of blend? Um, it, it, well, we're a bit of a hybrid. Um, it, it's, uh, I, I need a solid balance sheet. I won't invest in anything without a solid balance sheet because I need to know that the company's going to be there when the unexpected market crash comes along. I can live a long time with Johnson & Johnson uh, or, or Microsoft or those sorts of balance sheets that have very little debt and have strong cash flow, good management. Uh, I can do that for quite a while. So I need a portfolio, number one, that can endure. And then uh, I need a portfolio that can enjoy. Um, and I use both of those terms because, and I stole them from C.S. Lewis just while we're being literary and said that major events and decisions in life needed to be taken seriously because they would be, uh, they were going to be either endured or enjoyed for a long time. And, 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 and I think it's brilliant and I love C.S. Lewis anyway. So uh, uh, to build a portfolio that can do both is, is key. So if I find a company uh, that's a bit out of favor, that is increasing its earnings with a solid balance sheet, uh, I, I love to buy those companies. I love a peg ratio anywhere around one, price to earnings to growth. So if the growth rate at 10% is somewhere near 10 times earnings, oh, I love that company all day long. Peter Lynch, uh, famously ran Fidelity Magellan, said that yeah. earnings growth is the most significant indicator of stock price over time, stock price performance over time. So finding a company with growing earnings, you have to do not pay too much for it, and make sure there's a balance sheet behind it and some management that has navigated some tough waters in the past. You, know, you certainly uh, have reached, brought a concept that I've never really appreciated, but enjoying stocks, it sounds as though you're sort of like, uh, you get, you know, you almost need to make a decision to be, to be married to a stock because it's sort of like that good, you know, because if you're going to, you know, see it for a long period and endure it, then you need to be, uh, you know, sort of like, uh, you might say, well, look, you know, be, be, be very, very keen on it. So just on yeah. three that you've well, done. Well, we, 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 I mean, my average hold for a stock is six years. Right. I would love never to have to sell. My portfolio is somewhat concentrated. And if you're going to outperform any benchmark, you cannot mirror the benchmark. So then you have to have something that's going to behave differently in the industry. Of course, you and I would refer to that as tracking error. Mm. But you have to have something that's going to behave differently. And you put that together and hope that it will behave differently better. Yeah. Knowing that at some point, it will behave differently worse. And you can't just start selling it whenever it doesn't perform in line with the market cycle. You have to have something that's going to endure and perform through a market cycle. Yeah. And what about just the sort of the, you know, you've got three sort of industry tech titans. You've got Apple. Microsoft and Alphabet, and I put them all into the same because they are just best in class winners and really sort of like, you know, industry champions in what they do. And just to give you an indication, actually, Apple now, I think, is, is as big as the UK economy and is about the same size as the, the entire FTSE. So it's that, that's how that has done so well. What's your sort of view on those mega caps? Because they seem to have benefited just recently by that rotation from the the Cathy Wood Innovation Fund into effectively really secure, durable business models, but in the tech space. It, it, it's um, it, these these three companies, and and the other one I own, of course, is Facebook in that in that uh, cohort. Mm. It, it, the, the balance sheets are wonderful. They have dominant positions. They've been much more exciting than I think they should have been for a long time. I mean, well, that companies that get to be this large typically face a lar law of large numbers. To grow or see, uh, and, and my uh, grammar instructor would tell me that you can't grow earnings, you can increase earnings. I'm just in deference to my UK audience, but, but um, <laughs> uh, I know the difference. I'm just falling into idiom, all right? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, if we're going to uh, see these earnings increases at, at, at Alphabet and Microsoft and all of these companies, 10% is a much, a much larger number every year and much more difficult to sustain. That has to come down over time. Um, we've got seven and a half uh, billion people uh, in the world. Uh, 
you know, we can only grow at a certain rate and these companies are dominant and they can only become so much more dominant. Um, uh, yes, the top five have the same, uh, basically, uh, GDP, the value of those companies, same GDP as Japan. I mean, th these are huge, huge companies. And yet, they don't have debt. They continue to execute. And they've proven that they can execute during a, NAS a, a world global pandemic through periods of shutdown. Um, the world is now an interwoven fabric, uh, economic fabric. Uh, we are an interwoven commerce, I think, a marketplace around the world. And we're seeing some of the effects of when, the, when that marketplace gets threatened, whether it's by Russia, whether it's by China, whether it's by events in the Middle East, um, uh, all can be a bit disruptive. Where When I started doing this over 30 years ago, we didn't care what happened in any of those countries. We certainly didn't care what happened in Chinese markets at all. The only thing we cared about was what happened to AT&T. It was the largest part of the Dow Jones Industrial Average. If you knew what AT&T did, you know what the market had done. So yeah. the world's changing and evolving. It's really quite interesting as well, because when you look at it from a, van, a value perspective, those three stocks, I mean, if you look at their operating profit margins, they're roughly between sort of like 26% and over 40%. So let's just call it an average of 30% operating. So they only need to get to, and the PE ratios are about 30, 35 times. But to get back to your sort of golden rule of a one times peg ratio, because the margins are so rich, it's only they've only actually got to increase the top line by 10% per annum because it drops through to That's the right. bottom line, doesn't it? In fact, yes, it's it probably, does. yeah. In fact, it's probably it, even more than that because of the unique, unique economics, the actual drop through rate is probably even higher. So they're perfect. Right. They're, they're quite a good value plays from that perspective. Well, and, and for our portfolios, Paul, we have uh, probably 70% of the portfolios, these anchor names, mm -hmm. and then we have more uh, opportunistic names as well. I still love to try to find a, a name that's out of favor. Um, uh, and so FedEx is out of has been out yes, of favor. Yes, I was looking at that, and it's, it's only trading on thirteen times next year's earnings, which just seems extraordinarily cheap given e-commerce. I mean, why is it so cheap? Is it just because it's just it's, it's it's not liked or something? Well, yes, I mean it's 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 not well liked. Um, I, I think FedEx is a powerhouse company, and they've faced some difficulties in executing. And mm. you see these short-term aberrations of when markets react angrily. We, 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 we have uh, investors, in, I think, in the U.S. now have more of a, a four- to five-year-old uh, toddler mindset. Uh, we're, we're, we're prone to tantrum um, mm. at, at a minute's notice. Uh, and, and FedEx says uh, reports a miss because they had to pay higher employee costs because they couldn't find employees or higher fuel costs, or they had some disruptions in the supply chain and they couldn't get things where they get them. Well, is there anyone out there who hasn't been subject mm -hmm. to any of those things? And yet investors say, oh, FedEx is awful, and they punish FedEx and FedEx drops. FedEx, is a, FedEx is, appears to be one of those companies that I can own for the next 10 years. I hope to leave it as part of my estate to my grandchildren. Um, I might have to sell it if something changes, but, but um, I like it very much. CVS is a uh, pharmacy chain here in the U.S. And uh, they, in pharmacies here uh, in the U.S., as from many of the uh, folks who have traveled, of course, here, uh, know that there's a bit of a grocery element in the front of most yeah. of the pharmacies, and the pharmacy is kind of a smaller part. They've integrated an insurer but the stock has been trading for at 10 times earnings for ever. And 70% of the population in the U.S. lives within three miles of a CVS mm -hmm. uh, as they're going in for uh, vaccines. Uh, CVS is distributing vaccines. Yeah. There is a line in the CVS. And I went in, of course, to get my vaccines. I, I got the Pfizer vaccines. I've had my booster. I'm, I'm feeling good about that with the new <laughs> news with this new variant. I've got mine next week. Do you? Yeah. Uh, I, and I'll tell you, Paul, you know, the, thir the first two Pfizer uh, vaccines, uh, I, 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 I felt a bit glum the next day. 
Uh, not the third booster. The third booster just didn't didn't phase me at, at, at all. So I hope you have the same experience. Another one, um, which is another one, which is really cheap, is Norfolk Southern, which is basically a railroad. And I know Warren, you're a good sort of like hold on, because Warren Buffett bought a big railroad, didn't he, about ten years ago, Burlington? And there seems to be a bit of consolidation in that area because I did notice that Pacific, uh, Canadian Pacific, is acquiring Kansas City, isn't it, uh, Southern? So there's, it's quite an interesting. How, how do you see that investment thesis for the um, for the you know, Norfolk Southern the, the railroad? You know, it's a bit out of favor, and it's a very it's a small investment for us relatively. But I think that as you look at choke points through the supply chain and the value that we could get, I mean, we we were able to buy that rather inexpensively. Uh, it's probably not a core part of my thesis to be buying a transportation. But uh, through the supply chain, Norfolk Southern is very well positioned. Um, the freight that it's able to move and the cost uh, per ton is, uh, is remarkable. It's very, mm -hmm. very efficient. And, and, and we think that there is value there. And yes, we recognize that maybe you'll get lucky with consolidation, but I never buy a stock with the idea that there's a takeover or investment banking event in its future. Mm. And you've got some absolutely brilliant sort of world class IT consultants, Accenture. You've got, um, well, Gartner, obviously the research guys, but you've also got a smaller one, EPAM Systems as well. And I'll put them all into the same sort of like class of, of world class industry. Well, basically, they're, they're performing brilliantly. Do you want to take us through those? Because it's a whole digitization upcycle, isn't it, in the, in the B2B space, I guess? It is, and it's more on the service side of tech, of, 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 anything, uh, of anything else. When you begin to see, uh, one, uh, price pressures, some people will say, oh, you're going to cut the consultants. Well, but you don't. The consultants are how you expand your business, particularly when you can't find in-house employees. Mm -hmm. So we see this really as a way to benefit from the labor shortage and some of the supply chain issues. It's proved true, proven true. And with the greater adoption of technology in the U.S. around corporations everywhere, as people are still working from home, maybe working from home for forever. Um, mm -hmm. My son... Uh, works for a government contracting company. He's, it's a new company. He was hired in May. He is 100% remote in this, in this rather senior level job. It's remarkable to me that the economy can operate this way. But these companies uh, allow that uh, to happen more easily. And, and they're clearly like those big three, uh, Alphabet, Microsoft, Apple, Facebook. I believe they're here to stay just as well. And every single company is becoming tech, isn't it now, essentially, even, you know, the retailers, any, any traditional company needs to have a tech element and they can't, unfortunately, recruit best in class people in those areas because they won't go to them, whatever they're going to give them as money. They, they, they're going to, these guys migrate to the best operators where they've got the best career That's prospects. Right. But, you know, yeah. growth, growth, if you're going to see growth, Paul, we're running out of options for growth in the U.S. for GDP. GDP growth is just is, is a simple as a measure of two things, growth in your number of workers or your growth in population plus growth in productivity. Well, we don't have growth of population in the U.S. Now, we've got to add to productivity and tech is the answer there. By the way, I, I don't know if you saw this this morning, but China is trying to confront uh, their um, uh, population problem. One the most fundamental thing you look at as an economist is the growth in the demographic. Is the population growing or not? And China's hasn't been growing for years. So they eased off the one-child policy. They moved to a two-child policy this morning. And uh, it really does make me laugh. Uh, they are putting uh, serious restrictions on one's ability to get a vasectomy in China. Uh, <laughs> what now? Yes. No, no, no. You're... you're you're no, no, you're going to you're going to keep uh, keep yourself on the playing field. And uh, uh, we need some more kids and uh, whether you want them or not. So uh, there you go. Uh, that is incredible uh, planned economy, isn't it? Isn't it? But uh, I, uh, don't you love it? Can you can can you imagine? Can you imagine um, the prime minister coming out and Mr. Johnson appearing before the microphone? Yeah, saying, I know. Crazy. All right. <laughs> I know. All right, Britons, here we go. I know. No more vasectomies for you. <laughs> I know. Just on the uh, on the China angle, though, is that a risk for next year for 2022? Because 
it seems as though obviously they're having a blow up in the re in the real estate area with Evergrande, but perhaps more pertinently for investors, they've got this zero tolerance to all things COVID related. And that could really put a drag on their economy, particularly as they're sort of like, you know, trying to move away from heavily in, in let, um, indebted companies. And in fact, does the, 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 I mean, I, I, I read a stat, they're over half the world's growth historically for the last 20 years. China has been the world's growth engine for a while, and there are a lot of problems uh, uh, right now with the Chinese economy. Certainly COVID goes to a complete uh, shutdown, yes. Evergrande is a lot of debt, and I feel somewhat like we're whistling past the graveyard uh, there. That story is not over, and mm. they are in default. The other thing that's happening in the U.S. is this defense spending bill, which will be, it looks like it'll be passed in the next week or so. It's, I believe it's $768 billion, yeah. but $250 billion of that bill are to support companies in the US competing with China, also restricting uh, business with Chinese companies uh, that are suspe suspected of uh, intellectual property theft and technology theft, et cetera. China, in addition to our uh, diplomatic uh, boycott of the Olympics, is reacting very strongly, saying that they will uh, stop supply chain on certain issues with the US. So this trade conflict between China and the U.S. is only going to increase. And by the way, Chuck Schumer, the majority leader in the Senate, the Democratic majority leader in the Senate, this is the Democratic Party now. The liberals are leading this $250 billion part of this spending bill, are fighting China just as hard, if not harder, than Donald Trump and the Republicans. So this is, uh, we have very little consensus here politically in the U.S. Everybody is pretty much uh, bound and determined to go against China. And how, so how would you view sort of like the uh, big Chinese listed stocks on NASDAQ, the Alibabas and the Weibo's? I, I guess the far middle of Washington is not sort of heavily loaded in that area, <laughs> from what you've said. Uh, we can't do it. We, we, yeah. we, we just can't do it. And um, when, you know, it's very strange for us uh, and, you know, uh, in the United States and in the UK to think that someone like Jack Ma could just disappear from view and, you know, wanting to spend more time with his family and mm -hmm. working on his art. Uh, yeah, it's it's crazy. tough to own companies that can do that. Yeah. And then and, just and, and, on that yeah, just yeah. on that theme of sort of like, um, you know, stimulus going or fiscal stimulus, you've got the infrastructure coming through, the infrastructure plan. And I did notice you've got sort of um, Valmont Industries there, and you've also got Lowe's still there, which has obviously benefited from the DIY. But how do you see those sort of like those 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 stocks going forward? I did see that Lowe's is quite a bit cheaper, actually, than Home Depot, isn't it? It, and it has been for a while, and I think they're executing better. And one of the reasons that I stuck with Lowe's as long as I have is because they've been at a discount to Home Depot. There's always been a shift for years back and forth between Home Depot and Lowe's. And whenever one gets a better profit margin and gets ahead, all of a sudden they start cutting back on staffing a little bit and they cut mm -hmm. back on different things. And then they underperform and the other does well. But um, this part of, of the U.S. economy, I, I think we're seeing a crunch in housing uh, there's no supply in the housing market and people are doing a lot of home repairs. That, that I think, will continue to do well. Valmont Industries has been a home run for us. Mm -hmm. and, and, of course, I caution that anything I own that's done particularly well, while I'm happy about it, is no indicator it's going to continue to do well. Past performance, no indicator of future performance. Um, but Valmont uh, ha has been, I sing the hallelujah chorus every time I look at that. And, and, yeah. and uh, uh, it's, it's terrific. They make uh, all sorts of infrastructure and agricultural products. And one of the things that they do is they make utility poles. And when you think about the rollout of 5G in this country and all of the other advances, it is very well positioned and it hasn't been overly expensive. Now it's got government money coming that uh, I'm not selling it. And it's how do you reach a decision when you come to sort of like, you know, you look at a company, let's just assume you're very happy with the management team, the fundamentals look good. 
But w w what point do you sell on a valuation grounds? I did see Valmont Industries. I mean, it still is reasonably valued. It's only 20 times PE compared to the market. It's about the same as the market, isn't it? But what, what sort of like, what rule of thumb do you do? You, you've got your one peg ratio when you definitely love. What, how, what sort of rule do you have when you're sort of like looking to sort of trim a position when it's done so well? Yeah, we'll do it based on a, a couple of different things. And we have four uh, 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 tenants to our cell discipline. But certainly one is the position size. We won't let anything become more than mm, around 8%, 9% of an account. Uh, we typically have about 30 stocks in a portfolio and we won't go beyond that eight or nine because you can have a concentration risk. It's all about managing risk when you come to the sell decision. Uh, if there's a change in fundamentals, of course, uh, we will sell. Um, disingenuous management, we will sell. And the final is a change in thesis. Uh, we bought a company years ago that was a generic pharmaceutical manufacturer, and they were bought three weeks later by a branded pharmaceutical, and we sold it. It was nothing wrong with the company, but it was against our thesis. So you have to have, however you invest, Paul, you have to have a very clear, well-articulated discipline. And you need to follow that discipline dispassionately. It is that dis discipline and truly only that discipline that gets you through those moments like the spring of 2020 and keeps you from doing rash things that would feel so good in the moment and be so devastating longer term. Yeah. And then just finally, we come to sort of a couple of sort of like um, build tech software. And I'll put that in sort of the ANSYS and Trimble who have done remarkably well. And I, and I know a bit about this because uh, I've got my own personal investments out in, in the UK. It's, it's a very small company, but it's in this space, which is doing really well. But there's a bigger one called Aviva, which is doing fabulous. And Nemens yeah. Check in, the Euro, in Europe is doing great. And there's Autodesk as well. This seems to be a really, really hot area in terms of, you know, just fundamentals behind. You'll take us through the, say, Ansys and Trimble. Well, t and okay, wait a minute. You own these companies. Tell me why you think they are so attractive. What's what? Why is this? That is a very so good well? question. I was supposed to be the interviewer, but basically, the reason why I like it is that essentially businesses now are having to basically invest in in digitization and, and these build tech software of fact smart factories or or project planning of big infrastructure projects is so sort of like saves them so much time, resource and cost. But also more importantly, if you are a big site manager of yes. an infrastructure project and you are having to actually manage, let's say 300 contractors plus different raw materials coming in, given the supply chain crunch, there's only one way you're ever gonna do that on time and to budget, which is actually have world-class software, which is why I, you know, that, that was another reason why I think these guys should do well, but I was just trying to sort of like get prize a bit of see what, why you thought they were good ones. Well, uh, you know, I, I, I Paul, I, forgive me, but I do a lot of these interviews and I, I'm very often interviewed by very experienced, very bright people like yourself. And um, I, 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 I always take advantage and try and get a question into my own when I can. Oh, okay, that's uh, all right. Okay, you, I'll give you the you, grace that. So you, just, you have some expertise to offer here too. Okay, yeah. So just moving on there to the financials, you've got you've gone again best. I mean, that seems to be a theme of the portfolio is that you're going best in class. There's certain ones which are sort of like you know industry and champions and durable. You've gone sort of in the in the financial services. You've got Goldman Sachs, which I mean that's a verb, isn't it? It's sort of like the, you know the Goldman Sachs <laughs> of an industry. So you can't. And again, that's still. Still relatively cheap. It's on. I mean, admittedly, it's variable earnings, but it's only on nine times PE for next year. Admittedly, the price to book is a bit higher. But uh, do you know, why did you choose? Why did you choose Goldman, say, ahead of I don't know Morgan Stanley or City or Bank of America? You know, the financials have been uh, relatively inexpensive, and there has been a great concern about how they would perform during the pandemic. They've performed well. And the banking system in the U.S. is sound. It was not all that sound in 08 and 09. It is sound now. Uh, the other thing that, that uh, has kept those prices down has been relatively low interest rate, uh, this relatively low interest rate environment, and uh, a relatively flat yield curve. When a yield curve is a bit steeper, banks can have a greater profit margin. 
Longer term, Goldman Sachs is a machine. And, and the joke is in, in, around uh, the investment business in the U.S. is that Goldman Sachs customers may make money, may not make money, but Goldman Sachs will always make money. Yeah, they uh, you know, and, and their, their trading operation, their investment banking operation, uh, th their special products area, hugely, hugely profitable. You never want to bet against those guys. We've had several secretaries of the Treasury come from Goldman Sachs. Uh, I, I have a friend who thinks we ought to just outsource the government to Goldman Sachs and have it done with. Um, we'd save so much money in presidential elections, Congress, just, just let Goldman do it. Yeah, my uh, my brother, who's a far more accomplished investor than I am, he's actually ex uh, Goldman Sachs partner and owns owns a lot of shares in the company and still believes in them. So uh, I think uh, I think you've chosen very uh, very well there. So I hope he's correct. Well, one area that we haven't talked about, which has done really well this year, is energy. And how do you see that for next year? Because are we going to see some rotation in, in energy away from energy next year, given it's done so well? Or is it still, I mean, it still is really cheap. If you look at the big integrated oils, they're still probably on about, I don't know, 10 times P ratio, you know, your Exxons and your Chevrons. And stuff. I mean, I don't know what the numbers are, but they're, they're, it's certainly not particularly expensive. And this is probably a good one for us to end on. I, I, I think that... Um, uh, those companies look like they will continue to do well and that they've got a pretty good runway. I have a big problem investing in them as core positions right. because of the volatility of this commodity. Yeah. The, the commodity is up and down 10, 15% in the past week. I mean, down 15% in the past two weeks, up 8% in the last week. This is a global commodity. There's no rhyme or reason to that. It can be changed by regulations. Um, uh, you know, we, we have these, um, I understand the critical, horrible nature of global warming and what's going on and why fossil fuels are bad. The world is not ready, is not able, is not at a point that they, we as a world can do without fossil fuels right now. So uh, while they are a political bargaining chip and while it's a problem we have to solve, um, that it's a political ping pong ball doesn't is, is something as an investor I tend to stay away from. Uh, do it, can it can it continue to do well? Sure. Why did it drop fifteen percent in two weeks? I don't like owning things that can, can drop fifteen percent in two weeks. Mm. Remember the oil price was uh, the front month on crude was minus twenty eight. I think it was at the, the height of the pandemic. So uh, I could. I mean, I, I'm with you. I don't own any oil and gas either. So uh, for the, exactly the same reasons. In 2008, in the spring, we had a big market rally and oil from March 31st, 2008, was somewhere around $100 a barrel. By June 24th, it was 147 and a half. Now, what in God's name drives the price of a global commodity 47 and a half percent in less than a quarter when Goldman Sachs was calling for it to go to 200 yeah, it, that was the peak. And they increased it by another 30 some odd percent, their target. This is when, when I don't understand something, I don't own it. I just can't own it. One of my fundamental rules is I have to understand how the company makes money. Yeah. This has been such a great pleasure, Paul. Thank yeah, you. So no, much. Thank you. very, Thank you very much, Michael. I would say just as a hedge, if Putin ever decides to invade Ukraine, then the oil price is going through the roof. But we'll leave yes. it on that. We'll leave it on there. Thanks very much, Michael. I really appreciate your insights and comments and looking forward to hearing how the portfolio fares uh, next year. Thank you, Paul. It's been a great pleasure being with you and uh, uh, very happy Christmas and holidays to all of my friends uh, in the UK. Thank you.